This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Very happy to be here. Thanks, Jeff, for, for the um, invitation and um, and everything. So what I decide, what I will talk about today is something that is more on the computational social science side of things, right? But it will be, in a sense, in terms of recommender systems. And the, what we will do is we will try to do some, in some sense, some data analysis to understand what is going on when people provide evaluations. Uh, good. Maybe we need to close the door. Uh, cool. Okay, so <laughs> thank you. What, I, what, what, what am I talking about, right? So if you think about the web and on, online social computing applications and so on, right, people express opinions and attitudes everywhere, right? And they express these opinions and, and attitudes in many different ways, right? One way by expressing an opinion is just by clicking on something, right? Basically by clicking a hyperlink you say, oh, this is interesting to me, this is relevant to me, I want to see what is behind this, this, um, this hyperlink. This is the same thing is if you say you buy products in some sense, you, in some sense you say, you know, this is what I need, this is relevant to me right now, right? Then the other way how people on the web express opinions is um, through more explicit actions, like for example, rating pro products, um, pressing like buttons, and so on. And also we express opinions through text, both, both as writing comments, let's say, to news articles, writing uh, product reviews, and so on, right? And if you think about the, the success of, let's say, online, online um, uh, social media or social computing applications, they basically, they, they, their, full, their, their whole success is based on the idea or on the ability to, to extract opinions or attitudes of users and, some, and, and, and um, make recommendations um, and things like that, right? So all these sites that I have here, they are all basically providing value to their community by, by studying or extracting opinions from other members of the community, analyzing that, let's say, building a recommender system, and then using that recommender system to recommend you music, restaurants, um, products, um, you know, finding interesting questions for you, things like that, right? So that is, that is really how, how central evaluations are uh, to the web today. Right? If you think about evaluations on the web, then there are very various different things that humans evaluate. And the most common thing is that when you have a set of humans evaluating a set of products, right? So um, the way I will be thinking about evaluations in this talk is I will be thinking about them just as binary, as a positive evaluation or as a negative evaluation. So I won't be saying, you know, between one and five stars, I will be just thinking about a positive opinion and a negative opinion, if you like, right? And the first way, sort of where the, where the most of the evaluations on the web happens is in this kind of bipartite setting where I have a set of people evaluating a set of products, right? So, you know, people on Amazon evaluating microwaves and saying which white microwaves are good in which microwaves are bad, right? Um, there are two other cases that, are, that basically will be the focus of this talk. And this is when people evaluate other people. So the way I can think about that is in this kind of way, where I have nodes are now, um, nodes are now, now people, and one person is expressing an opinion about the other person. And what, what are the examples of this? For example, on Wikipedia, there is a public promotion process, meaning people explicitly say, I, I support this person being promoted into becoming a Wikipedia administrator, or, or I oppose this person being promoted. On opinions.com, for example, people rate other, other people in terms of saying, I trust your product reviews, I distrust your product reviews, right? So it's again, it's an evaluation about a person. And then the, the, the third way where people evaluate in some sense each other, but in an indirect way is when people express opinions about items created by others, right? So the way I can think about this is in this kind of setting where I have um, pieces of content, I have users, uh, users either express um, opinion about the piece of content or a red arrow here is meant to say that this particular user authored that particular piece of content. And where does this happen a lot? It happens, for example, on question answering websites like Stack Overflow or Yahoo Answers when you can say, I like your comment, I like your answer, or I dislike your comment, I dislike your answer, right? So this, this is, this is the, another example where the way you can think about this, you can think that sort of indirectly one person is evaluating another person. So what I plan to focus on in this talk is how do these kind of evaluations happen on the web, how, what kind of factors drive them, and um, what kind of useful problems can we solve by understanding these kind of processes um, on the web, right? So if you 
Now think about evaluations. And even though I was saying, you know, one person is evaluating another person, there are many different um, settings or uh, cases where people express these opinions and what, does, what, these opinions, uh, what these opinions mean. Right, so I was saying that in, in the opinions.com, uh, which is a product review website, people say, I trust your product reviews, I distrust your product uh, reviews, right? Then, for example, in, um, in other online communities, people can say, I agree with your opinion, I disagree with your opinion, right? So in terms of Wikipedia, I was telling you, people here vote, basically they express their opinions by voting and saying, yes, I support your promotion, I oppose your promotion. Or for example, in terms of question answering websites, or even on Amazon, you can say, Yes, I found this, this review helpful. I did not find this review helpful, right? So there are many different, in some sense, um, s different semantics of what does it mean to say to be positive or to be negative about something. And this can mean both in terms of trust, can, 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 be, can mean in terms of helpfulness, in terms of voting for a particular candidate, in terms of agreeing, and so on. What we will see at the end of the talk is that sort of all these, thing, all these things follow um, uh, exactly the same patterns, right? So the models that can model this kind of behavior from that kind of behavior, um, they are at the end the same. And they are so strikingly the same and so strikingly um, the results are able to generalize across the data set that it's kind of very interesting, right? So, so if you think about um, sort of online evaluations, where do, where, do, where do these kind of evaluations happen offline, right? And in, in academia, in, um, in universities, this is going on all the time, right? Sort of people evaluate people all the time. So what are some examples, right? You know, what decides whether my paper gets accepted to, the, to, the, to a conference or a journal, right? I create a piece of content, and then other experts from the field are evaluating that piece of content, right? So that falls under the same umbrella as what I'm talking about, right? Same is for funding for grant proposals, or for example, a more direct way of people evaluating each other is, you know, deciding who gets hired, uh, who receives awards, who gets promoted, and so on, right? So people explicitly um, here in, in the offline domain expressing opinions about, uh, about each other. So if now I want to talk about this one user evaluating the other user either directly or indirectly, um, here, are, here are some issues or some challenges or things that I, that, that I want to later address, right? So first, I would really like to understand you know, um, um, ways in which humans uh, evaluate each other. And here I want to understand what are the factors or, that play a role in this decision-making process. And sort of in some sense, I want to understand what kind of biases come um, into play when one person is evaluating uh, another person, right? And um, this, will, this will be, this is interesting, right? Because this will then allow me to think about new forms of uh, evaluations and, and uh, feedback, right? In a sense that, you know, can I, can I, can I, uh, in, I can allow for interaction between users. I can start thinking about, you know, um, computing, let's say, a composite opinion of a community from these individual uh, evaluations, right? So how do I aggregate all the individual um, uh, evaluations into a single decision that a community makes? And then what we will later see is that many times I don't even need to ask people for their opinion, but I just sort of see who shows up. And from that, I can already infer something. What do those people think about that particular piece of content, right? Sort of, I can use the audience composition as a way to extract uh, implicit evaluations. So that would be another theme um, that we will uh, touch upon towards, uh, towards the, end, the end of the talk, right? So um, to be more, pre more precise what I'm talking about, today I want to talk about um, how people evaluate each other. They can evaluate each other directly. This example of this was when one, one user uh, evaluates another user. This is the case of Wikipedia elections. I can talk about uh, indirect evaluation when, when one person, one member of the community is evaluating uh, a piece of content uh, or a piece of work that some other member of the same community created, right? So I can think of this in terms of networks like that, or I can think of that in, uh, as networks like there. So the question is, you know, where can I get the data that, that matches this kind, of, uh, this kind of process taking on? Um, I will be talking about uh, three different data sets uh, where this happens at large scale. So one data set where this thing uh, nicely occurs and it's all publicly recorded and obtainable is uh, the Wikipedia adminship elections, right? So you have Wikipedia um, editors and then for somebody to become, to be elected into a Wikipedia administrator, somebody has to nominate that person and then there is the, this kind of public uh, election process where other users of Wikipedia come and they either sign they na their name with a timestamp under the support section of the document or under the opposed section of the document. So we get a very nice clean um, um, 
a timeline of how the election took place, who showed up, who voted, how they voted, and so on. And here we will be uh, working, for example, in Wikipedia. Uh, in English part of Wikipedia, you have around 120,000 votes. You have around um, uh, 1,000 elections. Um, we also extracted elections for different languages or for different language Wikipedias, like German, French, uh, and Spanish. Um, um, and then I will be talking about uh, two other cases where uh, people evaluate each other indirectly through the piece of content uh, someone created. And in terms of Stack Overflow, which is a programming question answering community, very successful with like millions of questions, millions of answers. Here people come and say an up or down note a particular question or a particular answer, right? So you can say, I think your answer was good. I think your answer wasn't good. And we have around um, 7 million votes there. And then the, um, a similar data set is the opinions product reviews, where basically people rate each other's uh, product reviews. Again, sort of, I, here is not, right, the idea is that I rate your product review. I don't rate a product, but I rate the product review that rates the product, right? And uh, the way we will do here to binarize this thing, we will, since everything is positive, you know, everything has five stars, so we will use the five star rating as a positive, and we will call the one to four star rating as a negative rating, right? So this is, these are the settings where people evaluate each other or express, express this kind of binary uh, evaluations. So there are two questions that, that, or two or three questions that I want to ask. First question that I want to ask in this talk is, you know, what are the ingredients or factors that lead uh, people when they evaluate each other, right? Then I want to ask, you know, how do I create, as I said before, a composite uh, description or an ac that accurately reflects the cumulative opinion of the community, right? So what I mean by that is in Wikipedia, in Wikipedia elections, at the end, the guy, the candidate either gets elected or not, right? So there is a binary decision that comes after this kind of public deliberation process. And then what we will also look at is, you know, how do I use audience composition, maybe just seeing who showed up to vote to say something about what will happen with the election, right? Will the candidate be elected at the end or not, right? So how can I say just from the audience composition position something about uh, the, the piece of content or the thing that they are evaluating. So here is here's the setting now, right? So I want to know how people evaluate each other. The way I will think about it is that there is um, user A, I will call this user a voter, and I have this user B, I can call this user a candidate. And now the question is, how do properties of the evaluator A and the target uh, uh, B affect uh, A's vote, right? And what will turn out is that there are these kind of two fundamental forces that determine uh, you know, whether there will be a positive or negative evaluations uh, up there. So the first force we will call status, and the second one we will call similarity. And let me just define these two for you so that then we later know what we talk about, right? So what do I mean by status? So by status, what we wanted to capture with this, with this um, measure or this um, value that is assigned to every user is in some sense a level of recognition, merit, achievement, or reputation of a user in the community. And there are many different ways how you could try to capture this notion, and we decided to do something very simple. So all we decided to do, for example, was to say on Stack Overflow, this is the total of number of answers you contributed to the community. Or on Wikipedia, we operationalized this to say, this is the total number of edits you made on Wikipedia, right? So something very simple. It's just how involved are you with the community, and the more involved you are, sort of the higher your status in the community. So these are sort of very crude, crude, crude ways to operationalize uh, the notion of status. Um, you could do something smarter. We just did something very simple, and here definitely things could be improved, right? So that's, that's the status. What, is, what about similarity? What I mean by similarity is really sort of user-to-user -user similarity, right? So I, I want to capture something that, is, that, 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 that captures the notion of topical interest the overlap in the topical interest between A and B, right? And the way we will do this, again, very simple in practice, I will just compute the cosine similarity of the, of the vector of articles that two, edit, the two people edited, right? So if we edited, more, lots, of, uh, if we edited lots, of, lots of articles in common, then our similarity is high. If you, you, know, edit, lots, you edit political articles and I uh, edit articles on history, then our uh, similarity will be low. Um, in Stack Overflow, the way, the way we, we, do, we did this was also to use cosine similarity um, over the users that evaluated uh, your, your contributions. But the, the point is, there are two, there are two um, factors that we'll be talking about. One is called status. The other, the other one um, is called similarity that tries to measure sort of how well people know each other. Yes? So in Wikipedia, it's very obvious that people are actually evaluating each other. It's a, it's a promotion decision. Yeah. In Stack Overflow, the interface really de-emphasizes who the person is. So it feels more like you're evaluating the, 
the object than the person. Exactly. Uh, I wonder how that might act. Does that have any impact on the on the results you end up seeing, or you, it, it just kind of carries across? So, so what we saw is very similar behavior across these two very different uh, ways of evaluating people. I think you could find sort of, I think the differences come out as second order effects, which we haven't looked at. I will also show you later some very striking results where sort of you learn a model that predicts how people trust each other and that trust predicts voting as well as if you train your model on voting. So these things are very generalizable, which is kind of interesting and scary and funny at the same time. So but since status might also be encoding just raw ability. Uh, it could, but you have users of different of different age, right? So, so for example, raw ability um, you would imagine doesn't evolve over time, right? So, so here I'm just using this notion of status as a as a um, as one way of indicator about how people evaluate each other. So, you will see later that you can have two notions of status. One is the notion of status that I have here that is explicit. Then I will also have a notion of status that is implicit, that all basically comes from how other people evaluated you. And, that, and the behavior will be quite similar. All right, cool, great, thanks. So, uh, good. So, again, go, going back, right, I have status and similarity. And what I want to understand is how the properties of evaluator A uh, and the target B affect uh, A's vote, right? And uh, there are here are two hypotheses how this could be taking place, right? So here is the first natural hypothesis how this process could be, could be taking place, right? So one way how we could uh, postulate this is happening is to say that probability that our uh, candidate B receives a positive evaluation depends primarily on the characteristics of, of the candidate, right? So if I evaluate a, a good candidate, this good candidate will get a, has a high probability of receiving a positive evaluation if, if, and if the candidate is bad, then it has a low probability of receiving a positive evaluation, right? So the way you could think about this, for example, in terms of Wikipedia, this would be like, you know, that there is some objective criteria for user B to receive a positive evaluation, right? So in Wikipedia, this would be, you could say, if you are on Wikipedia for at least three years and you have done 10,000 edits, then, you know, the probability that you will be elected and people will give you positive evaluations is high. Right, so that's the first way how you could think about this process. The second way how you could think about this process is a bit different, right? You could say that the probability that B receives a positive evaluation depends now on the, the, re on the relationship um, 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 between the characteristics of users A and B, right? So what's the difference here? Now you, can, you could think about this process as basically that user A shows up, compares herself to the user B, and then makes an evaluation. Right, so here everything is relative, right? So um, a user A shows up, sees who the candidate is, compares the characteristic, characteristics of herself and the candidate, and makes a decision. So the question is, which one of the two is more true? So the way we tried to capture this is the following. So what we are interested in doing is asking, you know, how does the status of B, the target, affect um, A's evaluation, right? And the way we do this is that is is in this graph. What I'm showing you here is this is the target of the status, um, the the status of the target, so the status of the candidate. And um, what I'm doing here is I'm fixing the status difference between the voter and the candidate, right? And um, what do you see from this? There are sort of two observations that you see. So the first observation is that um, this line, the, the, the different lines are sort of increasing, right? So when the status difference is positive, which means that um, um, A has high status and B has low status, right? So A minus B is positive, which means A is bigger than B, then um, the probability of giving a positive evaluation is kind of small. For example, when, when the sign turns around, right? When I have somebody with a small number minus somebody with a big number, right? So that the status difference is negative, which means a, um, a low, um, low status person is evaluating somebody with a higher status, I have uh, the probability of giving a plus increases. So that's the first observation from this plot. And then the second observation from this plot is that these lines are flat, right? Approximately flat. What this means is that people really care about the status difference, right? So the probability of giving someone a positive evaluation when you have, um, when the status difference is 10 points and you have, you know, um, 100 point uh, reputation 
um, is the same as if, you know, you would have 2,000 point reputation and the other person has 2,010 point reputation, right? So it seems that people really care about the difference in reputation, not, let's say, the ratio, right? So in some sense, you could say it bothers you the same, uh, the same whether, you know, somebody earns $100 more a month than you, regardless of whether you are making $10,000 a year or $100,000 a year, right? So that's what this is sort of trying to say, right? Like the probability, the, these curves are, are, are flat, because here I'm keeping the difference the same, but I'm increasing the status of the target, which also means I'm also increasing the status um, of the evaluator, right? So what is, what's the take home message from here is, first one is that people, uh, people um, um, give the absolute value of a positive evaluation or the probability depends on the status difference. And the status difference is the important factor and for example, the ratio is not, right? Because these things are flat. So status difference is a, is a, is a um, salient feature even as A and B acquire more status. So that's, that's the, first, um, the first thing, which basically means that this idea of user showing up and comparing herself to the, to the target is how people make uh, decisions, right? That the status difference is an important feature when people make a decision how to evaluate uh, the person. Uh, this is the graph from Wikipedia, right? So that's the first, um, the first, the first uh, important observation. Now, what about the similarity? And if you think about similarity, again, you have two hypotheses how similarity would play a role, right? So you can think of, you can, here's first hypothesis, right? So first hypothesis is to say that, um, that uh, evaluators um, who are more similar are more supportive of, uh, of themselves, right? So the idea is the more similar we are, the more, the more I like you, right? So I'm more, more supportive of people who are in my own area. So this would mean that the, the relation between probability of giving a positive evaluation and similarity is positive, right? Um, the, other, the other one would be exactly the opposite. You could say, right, the more familiar am I uh, to the evaluator, the higher the similarity, the more I know their weaknesses, so, you know, the more harsh I can be to them. And, right, we have all reviewed papers from, you know, people who are doing research exactly as on, in the area that we do, and, you know, that it's very easy to sort of destroy that, you know, it's a piece of cake, right? So the question is, right, do people sort of destroy each other because they know each other's weaknesses, or they are sort of supportive of people who are working with them um, in their own area, right? And if you look at the data, here's the data, right? So this is now how similar you are. This is just the percentile uh, versus probability of a positive evaluation. What do you see? You see that these things go up, so that the first hypothesis is more true, in a sense that people are, support, are more supportive if they are similar uh, if, if the target and the candidate, um, uh, the target and the voter are similar. What you also see from here is that, you know, Germans are not so positive overall, and <laughs> Spanish, right, they are very generous, right? But still, you see the same thing, right? Like, all the curves have the same shapes. Yes? So I'm wondering to what degree there may be environmental context in the sense that if I'm doing reviewing within my own research community, it's almost all within community. And so I certainly have seen that weakness dynamic, or at least I, and it resonates with my experience. Whereas I don't know what the case is in Wikipedia or else, but if you have in-group and out-group people competing for the same place, you know, same uh -huh. positions, that's where I would especially expect to see similarity play a role. Uh, sure. That's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good, uh, good, so good observation. In some sense, here there is no scarcity of a resource, right? So in some sense, there is, I, when, if I want to be, become a Wikipedia administrator, I don't compete against you. In sort of the pool of possible administrators is infinite. So there is no competition in, in this sense. But what is, I think what is interesting is um, that um, even though, even though um, um, uh, this, is, uh, this is taking um, this is taking place, I, I, the way I would interpret this, I mean, I don't want to make any, you know, claims about the absolute order of this, right? That's sort of the funny part, right? But the, 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 I would say the non-funny part is that all these things have, have the same general slope, so this kind of increasing, um, increasing trend. And what I will later show you is also that, that these are sort of aggregate results. And if you look at the aggregate results, then, um, Sometimes you can make wrong inferences. And I will show you one example where actually it will, it, will all, it will seem from the data that people are the most harsh when they are evaluating their peers, which sort of would contradict this thing. So I'll show you some, some way how you have to be careful with data analysis. From here, the more similar you are, the more positive you are. That, let's let that be the take home message. Okay, so now, now I told you similarity, I told you status, so now what about the two things together? And that sort of also goes, to Jeff, to your question, right? So what I'm showing you here is the following. I'm showing the, the, stat, the difference in status. Zero means we have the same status. 
uh, positive means um, I have higher status than you if I evaluate you. And this is the other way around, right? I, I'm evaluating somebody with a higher status. And what I, the triggers, what do they represent? It represents when the pairs, uh, uh, when the, the pair of evaluator and the target um, have high similarity, medium similarity, and low similarity, right? I just took the, the, the I took the first 30% and so on and so forth, right? What, does, what do you see from this? What you see is that when, when people are highly similar, right? Um, when they sort of, when they know each other, when they work on similar subject areas, the status difference doesn't really matter, right? So um, people that know each other ignore status differences, right? When people who, who are of low similarity, who don't know each other, basically they behave based on the status difference, right? So here's the zero and you see if you are, if they are evaluating somebody that's, that has higher status than them, they're highly positive. If they evaluate someone with lower status than them, they're much more negative, right? So what, what, what sort of what's the take home message? The take, take home message is that status is basically a proxy for quality when evaluator does doesn't know the target, right? In the absence of any other knowledge, you know, you go, you count how, how many papers did that person publish, and now sort of have they published more than you or not, and you make your decision in a sense, right? <laughs> kind of scary, right? But that's, that's, uh, that's how you could uh, think about this, right? So now that I, um, that I showed you uh, status similarity and the interaction, I will, I will now, um, one, one important bias that also comes into play in this, uh, let's say, uh, elections is uh, who shows up. Right? So who, shows, who, show, who actually shows up to express their opinion? And um, here, is, here is how you can, uh, you can get to this. Again, for every time uh, um, A evaluates B, right? for all A and Bs, um, the status difference uh, versus similarity. And what this tells you is, what this shows is the following, right? is that um, when there is an election, basically high status um, evaluators that show up are similar to you, and these are sort of um, 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 uh, lo low, um, so the, in the, right, the, the, the bias in, in which, um, in, um, in which uh, things happen is that uh, elite evaluators, right, these are the evaluators that have higher status than the, the candidate, they vote, they show up to vote in their own area, right? So if, if, in some sense, if you want to be elected, you should get elites from your own area excited, right? You need a champion. And sort of in academic hiring, sort of something like this also happens, right? You need somebody senior uh, who knows your area who gets excited, right? Um, and that's, that's the, that, the reason why I'm showing you this, this, this graph is because here is what we can now, sort of a little puzzle that actually started all this research, right? So, so the, way we, the way you can think about this now is to say, okay, what is the probability that uh, A will give a positive evaluation to B as a function of the status difference, right? And based on the first plot that I showed you, right, those straight lines that were increasing, you could, the, the, our hypothesis is the following, right? It says that uh, based on the status difference, zero is the same status, um, negative is uh, A status is smaller than B and positive is the other way around, right? Is that depending on the status difference, the probability um, of uh, positive evaluation should be monotonically decreasing, right? And this is exactly how my lines were in the first plot I showed you. If you actually look at the data, the data looks a bit different, right? So here, this is now real data. Um, where here is, um, uh, here I'm plotting the status difference, and this is a, a probability of a positive evaluation, again, on Wikipedia. And what is interesting here is that, in general, this has this kind of downward uh, shape, but it has this dip at zero, or this bounce here um, um, just away from zero, right? So the way you can think about, basically, what this says is that people who have the same level of status you could, or the way you could think about this is that people that have the same level of status, they're the most negative to each other, right? It's almost like, you know, when I evaluate somebody who's at the same stage of my career, I'm very negative towards them, right? Then you have this kind of, um, you could call this a mercy bounce, right? When a high status person is evaluating you, they're like, you know, there is still hope, let's be merciful, right? <laughs> and, you know, this is like a grad student evaluating a pro paper from a famous professor, right? Sort of somebody with a low citation count evaluating somebody with a high citation count, if you like, right? So that would be kind of um, possible way to think about this, right? So uh, evaluations are especially negative when the status is the same. Um, you have this rebound, call it a mercy bounce, that, you know, when a high status person is evaluating a low status person. And the question is, you know, is this a real behavior? And actually, it turns out this is not real behavior. So you shouldn't think. This is, this is false interpretation of the data. 
And the reason why, why, why this is false interpretation of the data is that basically the way why you see this composite curve is because you are averaging um, these two plots together, right? So the way to think about this is the following, right? When the status difference is high, you have high similarity people show up. So you are putting lots of blue curve in, right? But when you are at the, at the negative side of things, right? You are putting in lots of the red curve, right? So you, are put, you have lots of red curve on the left, lots of blue curve on the right. So that sort of uh, weighted averaging the two together will give you a, a false bounce here, right? So what I'm trying to say is, are people most critical to the people of, uh, to the peers with the same level of status? No, they are not. There is this selection effect that makes your data look like they are, but they are really not, right? So that's, you have to be careful how you analyze the data. So, um, so what is interesting, right, is to say, basically the, the reason why this happens is because high status evaluators tend to be more favorably disposed uh, to the targets in their area uh, because of the increase in the similarity, right? So now, that I sort of showed you these two basic ingredients, status and similarity, how they affect evaluations. Now I want to show you like a cute application, how you can use this, right? So what I want to do is, um, so far we studied about how one particular evaluation is made. Now I would like to say, okay, but how, how are these evaluations summarized, right? How, how does the group then dis make a decision and say, you know, will the person get at the end elected, promoted or not, right? So what I would like to, to, to study next is to ask, you know, how, how to aggregate all these individual user evaluations to obtain some kind of composite opinion of the community, right? And even more interestingly, right, can I guess community's opinion from a small fraction of the makeup of the community, right? So I would just like to see who are the members of the community or what is the small part of the members of the community and guess something about their opinion. So the way you can formalize this into a, into a little prediction task is the following, right? So we call this a ballot blind prediction. So what we would like to do is we would like to predict the, the results of Wikipedia admission elections uh, without seeing the votes, right? So the idea is the following. I would like to observe identities of the first, let's say, five people that showed up to vote without knowing how they voted. Um, and I want to predict whether at the end the candidate will be elected or not, right? Um, why is this a hard problem, right? First is, I don't see the votes. Second is, I only see the first five voters, right? We, an average election has allow, around 120 voters showing up. Here, we just see identities of the first five. We don't see how they vote. The question is, can we say, will the candidate at the end be uh, successfully elected or not? So that's what, um, what we want to do and why this is an interesting problem, right? So the way you can think about this is, you have all these people show up, you know identities of the first few. Can you say anything about what the rest of the people that show up will think so that we can predict what, is the, what will be the outcome of this uh, decision process of the community? So here is what I, would like to, what I would like to do, right? What I would like to do is I would like to model a probability that this evaluator A um, votes positively on the candidate B, right? So I would like to model this simple probability, right? I know the candidate. Here is the, here's the voter. What's the probability that voter will vote positively towards the candidate? And the way we will, we will think about this is exactly what we know from our analysis, right? So our model will have, in some sense, a parameter for every user that says this piece of A is just what's the background probability of A giving a positive vote? So this is how positive, you know, out of all votes that A, a has given, what fraction of them were positive. So this is meant to, to measure whether the person is a very positive person, you know, whether they are Spanish or maybe they are German and they're just, you know, a bit lower, right? So that's the first one. And then the second one will be, will be um, the second term will now ask, you know, what is the relationship between the voter and the candidate? And based on the relationship, it will sort of go and modify this baseline uh, probability of, a, of voter A. So what does this, this, uh, mo uh, this, del this modifier depend on? It depends on the status difference between A and B. I call this delta. And it um, uh, um, depends also on the, um, on the similarity between um, A and B, right? And the way I will, I, will, uh, I will think about this is very simple. So the way we will think about this is that we will take this status similarity space and we will break it into four quadrants. 
right? So the way we can think about this is basically um, um, I take, I, I have a user A evaluating user B, I do the status difference, I do the similarity, and then um, what will happen is that uh, user B will fall in one of these four quadrants, right? So if I have high similarity um, and, um, uh, sorry, if I have high similarity and I have um, a positive difference in status, then user B comes from this quadrant, right? And for each of these four quadrants, I will f learn a single number that will say how much on the average does the probability of a positive evaluation change when, uh, when a user is evaluating someone from that particular quadrant, right? When you are evaluating someone with a, you know, with a particular relationship to you, either high or low similarity and either positive or negative difference in status, right? So my model is very simple, right? My model has, um, for every user I have one parameter that says how positive they are on general, and then I have four, param four more parameters across all the users, and those four parameters tell me for each of these four quadrants what's the average deviation in probability of being positive given that you are evalu evaluating someone from that particular quadrant. Yeah, cool, yeah. So, right, the way I feed this model is I just do counting. There is like it's as simple as it can get, right? But it captures this intuition that we saw before, right? Is that there is some baseline and then depending on whether the person has higher or lower status to you or is more or less similar to you, you, uh, you that changes your baseline behavior. And now that I, I'm able to model this probability of A, of A giving a plus to B, I will just take the first uh, five people and I will predict elected if this, if the probabilities of those five people that I, that I see showed up you know, sum up to some value greater than W. And I also somehow figure out what is the optimal value of W, right? And that's my model. So kind of very simple. So now the question is, how well does this work, right? So uh, here's the idea, right? So the idea is I, I see who shows up to vote. I see, let's say, first five voters, first 10 voters, and based on their status and similarity to, to the candidate and the simple model that I showed on the previous slide, we can predict, let's say, with like 75% accuracy what the outcome of the election will be. Um, what about other methods? For example, if I would um, be guessing, I would get 50% accuracy. If I would actually see the, the votes of the first five people, I would get 85% accuracy, right? I cannot get 100 because sometimes it can happen that the first five people are very positive, the rest is very negative, so these kind of things happen. So even if I know the, the votes, I get 85. This method that doesn't look at the votes um, gives you like 75. Um, and what is interesting is that all I needed was just status uh, and similarity, and that was enough. Um, to make this kind of prediction, which I think what this shows is more that how stronger these effects or these biases that come into people's evaluations. And this was done for Wikipedia, right? So um, what is an interesting theme here is that basically learning in some sense from implicit feedback, right? Just audience composition, the identities of the first five people that show up to vote tells me something about their reaction or it tells me something about the reaction of the community, right? So you could imagine you could use this kind of reasoning in many online cases where you see who visited your web page or your piece of content and you could do this kind of analysis or hopefully you could do this kind of analysis to tell you, you know, sort of extract what do they think about that, right? So that was at, at one level. Um, so now, so far sort of we, we focused on user A evaluating user B and we just took the, looked at this in isolation. So as I, as I showed before at the beginning of, the, of, of this talk, you can also do the similar thing, but now put all these users A and B together and create a big network, right? So the semantics of these networks are nodes are, nodes are users. A just mean that one user evaluated the other user, so there's a directed edge from A to B. And each edge either has a positive sign or has a negative sign. Positive means um, I gave you a positive evaluation. Negative means I gave you a negative evaluation, right? So now the question is, what can we say about the relationship between the network structure and, uh, and these evaluations, right? And there are two possible ways how to now think about the network structure and evaluations. And what I will, the first way to think about this is actually a status-based way of thinking about this, right? And the idea is the following. So now, one thing that you have to um, sort of uh, remember now is that status now is implicit. It is latent. So here I have an implicit notion of status, and it has nothing to do with the number of edits, right? So the idea is that the network will capture the notion of status, if you like. 
So the idea is the following, right? If people behave based on status, then every edge, every positive edge tells me that A has lower status than B. And every positive edge sort of gives me a constraint, if you like, that says um, A has higher status than B, right? So that would be one way how I could think about these uh, signs being attached to the, to the edges of the graph. And right, I can sort of apply this principle transitively over the paths in, in the graph. I can, um, for every uh, minus from A to B, I can sort of replace this minus with a plus in the other direction, right? So if pe people behave according to status, then uh, A giving a, neg uh, a negative evaluation to B means A has higher status than B. So this would mean that if B were to evaluate A, they would give them a plus because B has low status, A has high status, right? So I can do this and cre obtain a all positive graph and um, um, with the same status interpretation. So that is one way how I can think about evaluations in context of network. The other way how I can think about uh, evaluations in the context of network is it comes back to this idea of uh, structural balance um, back in 40s from social science, right? And the way I, I, I arrive to this other interpretation is that I think about um, uh, now, now my network is undirected and I can think about these kind of statements that friend of a friend is my friend, enemy of my enemy is my friend, uh, and so on. And if I take this, uh, these statements, and uh, think about them, what these statements really are, they are, they are, they are, um, Statements about uh, triples of people, right? They are statements about triangles, right? So now if I take this, this, uh, these statements and transform them into, into little uh, triangular networks and uh, ask about their structure, then the, the two networks here on the left I call balanced because they correspond to the statements above. And the other two possible ways to label a triple of nodes with pluses and minuses I call unbalanced because they don't correspond to the sentences above. So let me just show you, right? So this says friend of a friend is my friend, right? What this one says, Fre uh, my friend's enemy is my enemy or um, enemy of my enemy is my friend or my enemy's friend is my enemy, right? So these two are consistent with that and these are not, right? So this one would say, I have two friends who don't like each other, right? So if you think about this kind of structure in your personal social network, it's very hard to maintain it, right? You, you have to go to the dinner with the first friend and then separately to the dinner with the second friend. You cannot invite both of them together, right? So the idea is that this is kind of unstable, unbalanced. The way you can think about this one is, you know, think of a flat with three roommates who all don't go along with each other, right? So the way you can think about this is that, you know, sooner or later this transforms into an alliance, a common enemy, and this guy's out, right? So um, that's, another, that's another way how you can think about these things, right? So now the question is, you know, what, like, I showed you this kind of local uh, definitions of, of these theories. But what is nice is that this, both these theories give you some kind of global statements about the network structure. Right, so for example, the status interpretation, if status plays a role in the network, then the network, you should be able to sort it according to status, right? So what I mean by that is that the graph on positive edges should be approximately acyclic, right? So it means that I should be able to assign numbers to nodes in the graph such that positive edges point from no nodes of low number to the nodes with higher number, right? It's sort of, it's according to status, right? So one says, uh, three has higher status than me, and one says two has higher status than me. So one has the lower, the lowest status, B has the intermediate status, and B has, uh, sorry, three has the highest status, right? This is how the social network would look like if my status theory is at play. If my friend of a friend is my friend theory, so the social balance theory um, is expressed in the network, then what I, what I would expect or what, what would happen is that a balance implies coalitions, right? So I would, my network should look something like this. What do I mean by this? Is that I have a, a set of people who are all connected with positive connections, another set of people that are all connected with positive connections, and only negative connections across. And actually you can prove that based, if your network only has these balanced triangles from the previous slide, then the global structure of the network should be like this. And similarly you can show if people are behave according to the status um, hypothesis that I showed before, your network should look uh, like that, right? You should be able sort of to, just based on the network structure, infer the status of every other, uh, every other person in the network, right? Um, what is interesting actually, if you look at the data, it turns out that, that the, uh, the aggregate tend tendency is towards status. 
So it's not friend of a friend is my friend, but more towards, the, towards this kind of implicit notion of status, which at this point in the talk is not so surprising given that I showed you at the beginning how status is an important feature. But for example, here I'm showing you where the status and, status and balance theory, where they would disagree, right? So this one, for example, um, would say um, enemy of my enemy um, balance would say is my friend, so put a plus here. Status says put a minus here, right? It says A has the highest status, B has the lowest status, right? Why? Because, because A gave a negative evaluation to X and X gave a further negative evaluation to B. So it turns out that in real, in the, in the network data, people put a minus, so a negative evaluation here um, most of the times. Um, similar example, right? So now I could think about this as friend of a friend is my friend. So uh, balance theory would say put a plus here. Status theory says B has the lowest status, A has the highest status just because of transitivity of status. Again, in, in data it turns out that people tend to give negative evaluations when they find themselves in this kind of context in the network, right? Um, what is interesting is that actually these two theories are at work at different levels, right? At the level of triangles, it is the status theory that is at work, but at the level of, let's say, at uh, reciprocated ties, um, actually uh, balance uh, plays a bigger role, right? So what is the interpretation of status and balance at reciprocated ties, right? So balance would say, if I'm your friend, you also friend me back. Uh, status would say, if I give you a positive evaluation, you return that with a negative one, and if I give you a negative one, you return that with a positive one. It turns out that, for example, at this kind of dyadic level, um, it is balanced. So people reciprocate whatever they, uh, they receive. And what is interesting here, right, is, is thinking about these evaluations in terms of, you know, do they mean, yes, I agree with you, or do they mean, yes, I respect you, right? So, um, and this, based on the, the way you can think about status, you have this kind of dichotomy of what does it really mean to give a positive evaluation to someone. So, um, Another thing that I wanted to say in terms of how does the globally the network structure looks like, usually the way we think about social networks is something like this, right? We think, at least conceptually in our minds, of them as having this kind of densely connected communities that then have a few connections across, right? And the question is, how does, how does, how does the link structure and the signs, how do they interact? And to be able to answer this, let, let me define a notion of embeddedness of a particular edge AB, which is just the number of shared neighbors between A and B. So it's a number of common friends A and B having, have, have between them, right? So uh, embeddedness of edge AB is two, while embeddedness of edge BC uh, is zero because B and C have no friends in common, right? So now I can ask, what, how does the probability of an edge um, being positive change with the embeddedness of an edge, right? And if you look at this, you find that with the increasing embeddedness, the uh, probability of, a of, of edge being positive increases. What it seems to suggest, right, is in some sense um, on, on my previous slide that inside, inside the network where there are this kind of dense, dense clusters, you are more likely to see uh, positive edges, right, because those edges are more, more, more embedded, they have more friends in common, and then in the, in the, the bridge ties are usually more, sort of, are more negative than the baseline behavior, right? And what is a nice connection here is connection to the, to the notion of social capital. The other interesting thing is that this is Wikipedia, that's opinions. Um, an interesting difference between Wikipedia and opinions is that here is everything in public and visible, and on opinions, nobody sees your negative connections. So people can see who you, who you trust, but nobody sees not even the number of people you distrust, right? So here, there is no social cost to being distrustful. Here is, in some sense, a social cost to, um, to voting negatively towards uh, one another. And you can see if there is this kind of cost, then the effect is attenuated. Um, that's what you can learn from this. So the last thing I want to show in terms of the network structure and what can you do with the science is now trying to ask the following little prediction problem, right? I have my network. I know what everyone thinks about everyone else, and I want to ask what does A think of B, or you think of B, right? So I want to predict what's the sign of a particular edge in the network, right? And the way we will, we will do this is, again, super simple. All we will do is um, build a little logistic regression where for every edge we will uh, compute a vector of uh, 16 numbers, so we'll have 16 features, and these 16 features correspond to the counts for this particular edge that I want to predict in what kind of triangles does it participate in, right? So um, there are 16 possible triangles, directed signed triangles in which a red edge can participate. Why 16? Because for 
uh, this edge you have two directions and you have two signs. So we have four options here and four options there. So four times four is 60. So these are all possible signed directed triads and your red edge appears, you know, in a few of these, a few of those and so on. And you represent this as a long, as a, as a, 60, a vector of 16 counts. And now you just train logistic regression on top of that. And you ask how well does that work if you do cross validation and everything, your classification accuracy is, a, is around 90%. If you would do guessing, it would be 50%, right? So you can do this very accurately. What is, what is also interesting, right, is that you can do this accurately based just on the local structure alone, right? All you need to know is what do people in the neighborhood between these nodes A and B, what do they think, right? It, what, in what kind of triangles is this edge of interest embedded? And the last thing I wanted to show is to ask, you know, how generalizable are these results across different domains or across different uh, websites, if you like, right? And the reason why this is a good question is because the, the meaning of negative and positive edges in our data sets was very different, right? So in, in opinions, which is a product review website, people, uh, uh, the positive and negative edges mean I trust you, I distrust you, right? In Wikipedia, they mean I support you or I oppose you to become an administrator. Um, there was one more data set I haven't talked about. People know the Slashdot blog, the technological blog with a very, um, peculiar or interesting user community, right? There people can tag each other with a friend or a foe, right? So, you know, what, what is interesting? So here it's a very kind of serious public dis way of displaying your opinion. You know, you can screw someone, somebody put lots of effort to be nominated. Now you come and say, I oppose. What is interesting here is that based on this trust and distrust edges, uh, opinions decides which uh, reviews to show to the users, to the users that browse, and then actually you get money back from opinions, the better reviews you write. Um, slash dot, you would think that these things, like these friend and foe rela relationships are not clear how real they are. Maybe they're just a way of poking or teasing or something. So what we will do now is I will take my model from the previous slide, the 16 feature model. I will learn my model on the row data set and I will, pr I will predict on the column data set. So I'll show you a table, right? So here is my table and here are my results, right? So, so how should you read this table, right? So imagine the following, right? I'm interested in predicting uh, how people trust each other. I can take my trust network data, I train my logistic regression here, and I apply it to the same data set, just, you know, different part of it. Here's my accuracy. I can train my logistic regression using friend flow relationship from Slashdot. I obtain the logistic regression coefficients, but now I test my logistic regression on how people trust each other. You know, I lose 1% in accuracy. I can learn my logistic regression using Wikipedia data. So how people vote on each other based on these tri triangles, right? All that goes into my models are triangle counts. I obtain coefficients. I apply the same model on opinions data set. Again, I lose 1% in classification accuracy, right? So what is sort of striking here is that you have this perf near perfect generalization across very different data sets where the meaning of these evaluations is very different from like trust, distrust to, you know, support, oppose to being friend or foe in this kind of technological blo blog with um, uh, funny people, right? What is another, inter like the same is true for, 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 for predicting uh, slash dot. If, if you, right, if you train on trust, you can predict votes as well as if you train on, let's say, uh, the Wikipedia elections. Um, the same is true here also, right, on Wikipedia. The only difference is that now the absolute performance is a bit lower, but the loss of training your model on some other data set and evaluating it on Wikipedia is, is, is not that big. It's a few percent, right? So what, what this says is, what do I learn from this is that predicting votes seems to be inherently harder than predicting um, trust, distrust, or friend-foe relationships. But either way, this way of asking how is this particular edge embedded in the network very nicely generalizes across very different data sets, right? So the same model that was trained on votes can predict trust, distrust, or however you like, right? So um, basically the point is you get this near perfect generalization across different uh, data sets. So let me conclude and um, tell you sort of what I wanted to say in this talk, right? So what I wanted to do is provide you some perspective on human evaluations, right? Because on the web, in many situations, opinions and evalu evaluations are expressed, but sort of underlying principles of what drives them um, are not obvious, right? And my, my goal here was basically to provide some basic vocabulary for thinking about what are the in fundamental ingredients when people express these evaluations. And I showed you the, the importance of relative assessment through the notion of status. 
and I showed you the importance of you know prior interaction in terms of the user user similarity right and that was really sort of what I wanted to do what I wanted to do in this talk I think what are kind of interesting things that come out of this right is this idea you know of of status versus similarity and you know agreeing with someone versus um, saying that something is technically correct or you know respecting someone or uh, again agreeing with them right because we saw these strong biases according to stat to status right um, right and in what is interesting it seems that there are at least these two dimensions right status and similarity that drive evaluations but in online cases in right you are usually just Collapsing all this to 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 a single to a single dimension when you ask them you know what uh, you ask them to give you a set uh, a set of stars or thumbs up or thumbs down or whatever right while it seems that these evaluations can mean different things depending on the relationship between uh, voter and the candidate right um, and just what are some interesting things to uh, to think about is right I thought the, the the second part of the talk where this idea was you know how do how do how do how do people form collective judgments or how can I say something about the opinion of the community from the makeup of the community is is I think a, a powerful way to think about online systems right we were talking about uh, predicting outcomes without explicitly seeing the seeing the feedback right so predicting elections without seeing the votes um, actually we have a follow-up work where we were looking at stack overflow and just based on odious composition there it allows you to identify uh, uh, questions that have long-lasting value or it allows you to identify questions that don't have sufficient answers right so just based on the dynamics of how people come and start answering your question you can tell a lot about how the question how the question site page will look like in you know in a year from now whether it will be sufficiently answered and so on so for example here we were trying to predict how many google how many page views will that question page get in a year from now and if you just see what happens with the question page in the first five ten minutes you can guess quite well what will happen to the question page in a year from now right will be this something that will be highly popular and highly accessed or nobody will nobody will bother about that particular topic anymore so um, with these things um, I would like to end sorry I went a bit over um, thank you very much um, I don't know questions or so I'm wondering how this would get it seems like another high level fit in this might actually be high strength that is, if you, if you actually lay on to this, the fact that people uh, are embedded in a different, their own layer of social network, right? Uh -huh. um, there, it, may, it may just end up flattening onto similarity in a sense, but it feels like theoretically there's something else going on there that, you know, I'll stand up for my friend, uh, or, you know, I'll, I'll actually vote against my enemy even if I respect them, or something like that. Sure, so I think, I think what is now interesting is, um, um, is I think these notions that you are mentioning are in some sense captured in the notion of similarity, right? It's like similarity means have we worked on similar articles before, right? So if we've worked on similar articles, we have probably interacted with each other in the past. And um, so you could now start seeing, and I, sh I show this, right? If you have this kind of strong, in some sense, strong tie, or if you have prior interaction, then status difference doesn't matter anymore, right? So the, the probability of a positive evaluation was very high. For example, in these plots, which I think is is interest. Like I think what would be cool now, I showed you very kind of aggregate results, right? So I think what would be cool now to zoom out, to zoom in on some of the kind of you know subparts of my of my results and try to see what is really going on in individual cases when maybe you have a weak tie, uh, but people are still similar, and try to bring in the notion of tie strength in terms of you know have we actually discussed things in the past? Maybe you know I edited this article a year ago and you edited it today. It is it's very different than, right, in terms of similarity that would make a similar, but it's very different if you edited it yesterday and I edited it today, for example, right? Consider a network like Facebook where everyone is in theory very similar to each other, mm -hmm. right? Because they've actually explicitly made this, this connection. Yeah. Exactly. So then you might actually see, I don't know, maybe status actually then plays a much bigger role. Uh, I also like this. So it would be cool, for example, if you would have a social network on top of which you would have evaluation network, well, right? Yeah, yeah, that'd be cool to study. Um, I mean, what is and one thing that is that is important here to note is, for example, so opinions data set. What is funny there is that nobody sees your negative evaluations, right? So people see who your friends are, but nobody sees who your enemies are. So in some sense, there is no social cost of calling the rest 
of the community um, enemies. But what was interesting, right, was that um, the behavior, the people behavior was still the same in, in opinions as in other data sets, even though this kind of negative information is completely private to you, which I think was also an interesting bit that came out of this. Uh -huh. So there are not examples that you showed, but there are, think of two different examples of winning the California lottery or winning okay. performer of the year on American Idol, where presumably your status changes overnight in a massive way. So you have a discontinuous big change in status. Uh -huh. Does your research predict anything about how long that it takes uh, for people's evaluations to change based on a radical change in status. That's, I think that's great and we haven't really looked at that, right? So, so, so there are sort of two, I, in, in, maybe I, I used my wording unfortunately because I had this kind of explicit notion of status which was through the edits and I had this implicit notion of status through the network, right? And one thing that we were thinking of doing and we never got to it was to ask, right, if you have a community and this positive and negative edges point in the direction of status, then at the beginning when sort of, you know, people are in the room and they don't know who they are, this, you would imagine that these uh, connections would sort of flow randomly. But over time, people would figure out, uh -huh, these are high status people, these are low status people, this is how I behave. So one way to test your thing would be to see, you know, do, do if you use some kind of final status hierarchy towards the end, do, do the edges over time be, start to follow the status hierarchy more closely than maybe they were at the beginning. So that'd be one way to do it. We haven't gone to that, but that's an interesting way. I mean, here we were making an assumption that status is completely intrinsic inside the community, which most of, mo most of the cases is, but you could have something external. So, good point. Thank you. It seems like the examples you gave throughout the talk have some interesting differences from some of the possible generalizations you identified at the beginning, such as, um, say, infant research, for example. In <laughs> So some of the dimensions that seem very interesting include um, you know, the fact that voting is voluntary. So you have like a pool of voters in which people can choose to vote or not to vote, right? Scarcity that came up earlier. And then also, you know, there's other issues about whether or not, in this case, people's identities are available to the person doing the voting, which in blind review you might not have. Uh -huh. So obviously lots of other parameterizations or configurations you could think about. I'm just wondering, do you have any thoughts along those lines of what impacts those manipulations might have? Um, so whenever I give this talk, I sort of, I didn't end this one that way, but I always ask, you know, if you're a conference chair, please give me your reviewer data. Yeah. Because I think it would be super interesting to see, you know, what happens there. And all you need, right, you don't, the data can be anonymized. All you need is be able to link researchers to DBLP so that you can do similarity, right? And then status, again, sort of you can do Google Scholar to get citation counts. It would be interesting to see what's going on. I, I wouldn't want to speculate, actually. Uh, <laughs> but it would be cool to see, right? I think it would be super cool to see. So even on a small sample, I think it would be super cute to try to do this in you know, real academic evaluations. And I think what, like, we'd be shocked with the results. Uh, good, OK, great. And anything else? Thank you.